so the, my title is A Screen is Only the Beginning. Um, I started in, at the University of Marburg in Germany, where I did my diploma in human biology, and then moved to ICGB in 2012 to do a PhD with Mauro. And since 2017, I've been a postdoc with Serena. And you might think, judging by the photos, that I choose places to work and study only by how beautiful they are, but that's not the only reason because I came to ICGB because it seems to me that it's the one unique place worldwide where you have a combination of translational science, but also um, a drive towards science for development. So we used to call it developing knowledge, now we call it science for development. And um, it's a focus that is very, that I'm very passionate about, to use science to do something good in the world, and then said in a naive way. Um, what do you need for translatable science? High throughput screening is an extremely powerful tool for translatable science to find therapeutic solutions. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details. Luca Braga said a lot last week about the, the different details about screening and what different approaches for screening. I'm just gonna focus a little bit about how do you, can you use screening to find therapeutic solutions? So the, the power of high throughput screening of HTS is that it allows you to observe functional effects of a library of molecules. And you can use it to address a disease directly. So what do you need to do to do this? You uh, simplify and abstract the disease into its basic components. You identify the key component that best represents the disease. And you make sure that this component is screenable in a robust and reliable manner. So what does that mean? For example, in this case, we have um, a piece of a lung that is fibrotic. So you can see in green, you have expression of collagen. And in red, you I'm marking alpha SMA. This is from a reporter mouse. And fibrosis as a disease is an interesting thing to study, but you can't put the lung in, the, in a high throughput screening. So how can you break down this disease into its components? One part, for example, which is an important aspect of um, pulmonary fibrosis is inflammatory infiltration, which is something that in a screening is difficult to study because it's an um, organismic result and not something that you can reduce to a cell-based assay very easily. Another aspect is expression of TGF-beta or extracellular matrix secretion, which are already a lot easier to screen, but they're still multicellular. Then you have a reduction in epithelial cell survival and transdifferentiation in lung fibrosis. And also this, you can, you can do a very nice cell-based assay, but epithelial cells are relatively difficult to isolate and the yield is low, so it's also not the perfect assay to be studying this disease. You also have fibroblast activation and transdifferentiation to myofibroblasts. This is something that is extremely easy. Fibroblasts are easy to isolate. You can easily put them in culture. They easily adhere to a plate, and you can track their differentiation to myofibroblasts. So generally, in order to look at a disease, you have to look at all the components and see which part is actually important, which, which aspect from beginning to end of the disease do I actually want to look at, which is the source, what is the part that I want to target. So since arriving at ICGB in, in 2012, eight years ago, I've worked on many projects that are linked to high throughput screenings that have been based on high throughput screenings. And I'm gonna to talk to you first about my um, project during my PhD, which was a high throughput screening to identify antisenescent microRNAs. Why senescence? Senescence is something that, um, it's a cell cycle arrest that experimentally is reversible, but generally in vivo is permanent. You have an accumulation of senescent cells during aging. And so senescence is an integral part of a lot of different age-related diseases. So it's linked, for example, to sarcopenia, to muscle weakness. It also plays a large role in the cardiovascular system because you have a decrease in muscularization due to senescence or where senescence plays a role. You have um, an increased risk of atherosclerosis. You have an increased risk of myocardial infarction. And you also have, um, for example, wound healing. Senescence plays an important role. So it's a disease, it's a cellular state that has a role in a lot of different diseases. In order to study this, I use the cells that are the main model of, of cellular senescence, which are WI38 fibroblasts. So I used our high throughput screening facility, which back then looked a little bit different, but it's been updated a bit since then. I used a library of around 800 human microRNA mimics. That's also been updated, our new library is larger, and added my senescent fibroblasts on top. Um, then at day three, I added a nucleotide analog that marks synthesizing DNA and therefore is, can be used as a marker of proliferation. And on day four, fixed and stained for EDU, so for the proliferation marker and for P21 to mark cell cycle arrest. 
these were the results of the first and second replicate of the screening. So the overlap of the two screens was very nice. Um, and I found two uh, very powerful microRNAs, MIR523 and MIR639. Those were my top hits. But here on the right, you can also see an overlap overview of all the hits of the screening, where the size is dependent on the increase in proliferation that they induced. And it, I've, been, I've grouped them by seed sequence. So a microRNA has a seed sequence. Nucleotides 2 to 7 represent the seed sequence. And that, those are the nucleotides that are most involved in um, binding to the M target mRNA. The nucleotides before and after also play a role, but those are the main ones. And so you can group them, group microRNAs into families based on the seed sequence. And as you can see, there's a lot of the families had very similar effects in the screening, which is always a confirmation that your readout is working well. Um, most of the hits were novel, which is good when you're doing a screening. But there were also two uh, families that were highly represented as inducers of proliferation that are known in the literature. So one of them is the MIR-17 family, and one of them is the MIR-302 family. And these are both, the MIR-17 family, for example, is known to be downregulated in human aging and, um, and cause proliferation if you overexpress it. And the MIR-302 family is an um, embryonic stem cell marker. So it's also another proliferative microRNA family. So that also confirmed, again, the, the screening approach and the, um, the ability of the screen to find potential interesting hits. I validated the top 20 microRNAs from the screening and saw an inverse um, correlation between the amount of proliferating cells and the amount of P21 positive cells or P16 positive cells. And here you can see the effects of MIR-53 and MIR-639. So you can see there's even an increase in the number of cells and a, high, a large increase in proliferation. Interestingly, this also worked in the complete absence of um, FBS. So even without any growth factors in the medium, the cells were still able to reinitiate proliferation. I wanted to be sure that this was not just an effect of EDU because EDU marks DNA synthesis and not, um, and not proliferation per se. So I also did an assay for Aurora B midbodies in order to see that um, with and without FBS, the transfection with my microRNAs, my top hits, MIR-53 and MIR-639, were able to induce an increase in the percentage of cells that showed Aurora B midbodies as a marker of cytokinesis. And in live imaging, I also was able to see uh, cell division of transfected cells that were previously senescent. The next step was to find the targets. So for this, I did a um, transfection of the microRNAs, of my cells with the microRNAs again, and then a transcriptomic analysis. Um, I found 591 genes that were downregulated by transcriptomic analysis by these two, gene, by these two microRNAs and then did an sRNA cherry picking of 545 of these genes in order to see which um, sRNAs could replicate the effect of the microRNA. So which targets of the microRNA are important for the phenotype of proliferation. I um, found 11 genes that when knocked down could increase proliferation by twofold or more. But upon validation, the one that I was able to confirm also using a three prime UTR from P21 luciferase construct was that P21 is a direct target of both MIR-523 and MIR-639. So using a construct where you have the 3' UTR of the gene of CDKM1A, you would transfect the cells with the microRNA and you can see whether the luciferase signal is reduced in order to see whether the target is direct. So I now know that this, these microRNAs are directly targeting P21 and that that's probably the main cause for the proliferation aspect. But there's more things going on, obviously, in the cell because microRNAs can have many different targets. Um, in order to see which pathway they're using to induce proliferation, I um, tested a panel of different inhibitors in order to see which, inhib which um, proliferation pathway inhibitors would block the effect of the microRNA. And using rapamycin, I was able to uh, um, decrease the amount of proliferation induction that was caused by the microRNAs. In literature, it's also known that um, the mTOR pathway is constitutively active in senescent cells, which might seem a little bit counterproductive because it's a proliferation pathway, but um, mTOR drives the production of the senescence-associated secretory phenotype. And there's also a theory that if you have a cell cycle block such as P21 and you have this mTOR drive, you're, you actually induce increased senescence because you're driving the cells into this block. Um, I was able to confirm that there was a basal activation because upon 96 hours of starvation and 0% FBS and then transfection, um, my cells had a basal activation of um, mTOR seen through the readout of phosphorus 6 and phosphorus 6 kinase. 
using rapamycin, I was able to decrease this, but in both cases, I still have a knockdown of P21. So the knockdown of P21 comes first, and then there's, they use mTOR in order to drive proliferation. I see the same thing if I knock down um, components of the uh, mTOR1 and mTOR2 complex, I'm able to reduce the proliferation induced by MIR523 and MIR69. Now, in order to go, this was a, a rough description of the mechanism. So they, they target P21 and use mTOR to drive proliferation. But we also wanted to see whether these microRNAs could do something in an in vivo model of senescence. As I told you before, senescence is important in the cardiovascular system and um, plays a role in reducing angiogenesis and vascularization. vascularization. Um, so what I did is I transfected HUVEX first in vivo. HUVEX are human umbilical vein endothelial cells. I senesced them in, in culture, the same way that, as I had done with WI38, and then transfected them in in vitro. Um, the microRNAs and also SIP21 was able to increase proliferation dramatically. I then took these transfected HUVEX, so two days after transfection, resuspended them in matrigel, injected them subcutaneously in NSG mice. And after five days, there was still an increase in proliferation, but at 30 days, when harvesting the plugs, the increase in proliferation was no longer significantly increased, but there was a significant increase in the number of microvascular, the microvascular density, and the number of structures that had at least five nuclei, five endothelial nuclei in a row, which was an, a very satisfying result because it means that the microRNAs were able to drive proliferation and rejuvenation in the beginning, but don't cause tumor tumorigenicity because you don't have overgrowth of vessels and extremely high proliferation in the long term. But you seem to have increased functionality. So after having completed my PhD project, I moved on to, um, ah, before moving on, I used the senescence model also for another project um, together with Lawrence, the lab of Lawrence Banks. Uh, we wanted to use the senescence cells as a model for um, viral persistence. So here we infected um, cells with the human papilloma virus. And human papilloma virus needs mitosis in order for um, the genome to be replicated. And we wanted to use this model in order to understand how long can viruses persist on cells before the cells go into mitosis. So we infected cells, and then after one week, two weeks, or one month, we reactivated them using SIP53 and saw that if you um, reactivate cells after 16 days, so you reinitiate mitosis after 16 days, you have an increase in the amount of luciferase produced of an HPV or viral-like particle that encodes luciferase. So you have an increase of infection after 16 days of infection, which means that you add the, the virus to the cells and it's able to persist on the surface of the cell for an entire 16 days before the cell goes into mitosis and the virus is not degraded and not removed and it persists. After 30 days, this effect was lost and we were also able to see by, micro by microscopy that in the beginning, if you have senescent cells that you infect, the virus tends to be on the surface. It's also able to be neutralized by neutralizing antibodies, so that also, that also supports this theory that the virus stays on the surface. Whereas if you activate the um, cell division with SIP53, the virus enters the cells and co-localizes with both early and late MSO markers. After having completed my PhD with Mauro and my work with senescent cells, I moved on to Serena's lab and worked on several different projects that were all based on high throughput screening. And one of these was a screening that helped us identify a possible biothera biotherapeutic for uterine fibroids. So as I told you in the beginning, a screen is only the beginning. And in fact, this screen started with a completely different scope in mind. So in this case, it was a collaboration with Professor Andrew Baker in Edinburgh. And we performed a high throughput screen to identify microRNAs, which can increase or block proliferation of smooth muscle cells. And it, this was in pulmonary hypertension cells. I then validated these, the top hits of um, both pro and anti proliferative microRNAs in saphenous vein smooth muscle cells, coronary artery smooth muscle cells, pulmonary arterial hypertension, smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, and endothelial cells. And that group is currently, the group of Andrew Baker is currently working on this. Um, on the hits from the screening in um, a context of decreasing smooth muscle cell over proliferation when you insert heart stents. Oh, touching the microphone. Um, we decided to use it for a different, completely different 
scope. So I took the, um, the data from our hyperfoot screen, which was on smooth muscle cells, human smooth muscle cells from pulmonary hypertension, and took a step back and just defined them as smooth muscle cells per se. And we have an ongoing collaboration for years with the Guru Garofalo Institute uh, Hospital in Trieste. And they have a lot of lyomyoma patients because lyomyoma is a gynecological um, disorder that affects a large amount of women. And, um, and so far, the only real treatment, the treatment that is used, is surgery. So they're very interested in finding a possible biotherapeutic for this. So they, they're collaborating with us by giving us tissue. Um, I took all the proliferative microarrays from our screening data, from the smooth muscle cell screening data, to see which microarrays are, in, are increasing proliferation. Then I checked literature for which microarrays are known to be expressed in myoma, and using the overlap, so everything that increases proliferation and is expressed, I decided to block with LNAs. LNAs are linked nucleic acids, antimicronase, so they're stabilized antimicronase that can um, specifically block a single microarray. And this is a, a, a tool which is very interesting for future applications, and there's a lot of companies working on it. There's also been some tests done in primates so far, because if you use a microRNA in the clinic, you have a large, large um, panel of targets, so it's very difficult to define what, what you're doing. And also, microRNAs, even if they're not endogenous to a cell, they're still going to have an effect on that cell, whereas LNAs will only have an effect specifically in cells that express endogenously the microRNA that you're targeting. So they're a lot easier to, to use for a specific treatment than microRNAs are. Um, doing this, this overlap, I was able to um, come up with several microRNAs that are known to be expressed and that are also proliferative in the screen. So here you can see the list of microRNAs. This is the um, full proliferation that they induced in, in my screening and the rank. And here's the expression ratio from um, Lyomyoma, uterine fibroid versus healthy myometrium. And this was the, um, the expression reads, just to compare the level of expression between the different microRNAs. And so I chose, first of all, I chose the two that are expressed the, oh, before that. You can see, if you look at the seed sequences, that there's a lot of similarity. So there's several here marked in blue. There's one that they're all identical. In red, there's another family. In yellow, there's another family. But even amongst that, there's this seed sequence, AGUG, that is present in almost all of the hits. So there really seems to be an, an overlap in the, in the targets that they're going for. So in order to validate these, um, the microRNAs and the ability of using an LNA to block these microRNAs in myoma, I chose, first of all, the two that, uh, that had the highest count, so the, first, the two that are most expressed. Then another one that is not highly expressed, but we know from previous screenings to be an interesting um, microRNA, so we decided to go with that one anyways. And then two more as a positive control. So these are both from the MIR-17 family that I mentioned before, that's a family known to be very proliferative, pro-proliferative, and um, I chose those as positive controls for, for moving on. And here's the, the position of them in the, final, in the original screen. MIR 148A, 148A, 199A, and 33B were the, the most interesting ones that we picked up. Um, I then validated these both in smooth muscle cells and in fibroblasts and saw um, that using an LNA to target these microRNAs in smooth muscle cells significantly decreases proliferation, but using them in fibroblasts has no effect. So that shows that there's, it's much easier to have a cell-specific effect with LNAs than it is with microRNAs. I tried them also with gymnosis, which means you add them onto cells without any liquefaction reagents. So you just add nude microRNAs onto, the, or nude LNAs in this case, onto the cells. And also there, the effect was much weaker, but there is still an effect visible from the, um, from the treatment. We then went on to patent these three microRNAs, the top three microRNAs, and in order to apply for a buyer grant, which I was able to win, um, they're one of their focuses is gynecological therapies, so they're, um, they're very interested. And they also in-house have a model where you take um, lyomyoma tissue that you digest and you do subcutaneous injection to do a xenograft model. So we now want to work together with them in order to validate these also in vivo. So that was a bit of an example of what happens beyond the screen. You can take screening data and do more things with it than it was originally intended for. Um, I want to tell you now about Another project that I've been heavily involved in, so this was an interregional project that uh, Serena won that was recently completed, 
Um, the name was TRAIN, High Throughput Screening and Big Data Analysis for Innovation. And the main aim was actually cross-border contact between industry and academia. But there are also several research components. So for example, one of the main things that I'll go into more detail on afterwards is um, a project where we combine high throughput screening data with machine learning. Then we also assembled a portfolio of in vitro high throughput screening assays that can be used to model different diseases. We also worked on several 2D co-culture disease models and some 3D in vitro model of skin using scaffolds and a co-culture of fibroblastin endothelial cells from adipose tissue. So those were all the, the research components involved in this, in this project. Um, the portfolio of in vitro assays that I assembled were, I, I picked out some of them here just to show you an example of what I mean. So for example, if you want to study angiogenesis, you might say it's interesting to use assays that look at proliferation, cell death, tube formation, and EMT. If you study cardio, if you study cancer, you might say it's interesting proliferation and cell death are still interesting, but I also want to look at senescence, DNA damage, and oxidative stress. Or if you're looking at cardiac diseases, you might also add autophagy and macrophagy. So there's a lot of ways where you can have different assays that can be combined in different ways to represent different diseases. Another big part of this interregional project was science outreach and um, working together with Tovarnatec, a company in Slovenia, who developed a beautiful virtual reality version of the high throughput screening facility in order to make um, the public understand better what it means to do a high throughput screening. And we've used this in several public events so far. Now with COVID, it's a bit more difficult. But I'm going to show you what there's a um, video on YouTube that beautifully shows what has become of this. This is not the final version. But you can see here, you have the high throughput screening lab. They actually came into the lab and scanned some of the machines. So this is the actual wash plate washer that we have. These are some microscopes that we have. This is the Envision plate reader. You go over here, you press the button to start the screen. Once the screening has started, you can see the machine's working. This does not look like the real machine, but <laughs> it's a simplification. You can then also exit the room and enter the room where the patient will be treated with your treatment in the end. So you have um, here an antifibrotic treatment, a uh, treatment for proliferation of cardiomyocytes, and here you can see the heart and inject it with different microRNAs. So you can experience the the translational effect of your screening. And then um, the most interesting part of it, the most exciting part of it, is when you go back to the lab, you can then enter the actual screen machine. So you enter the actual high throughput screen, and you end up in a void where you have three cubes. This is a cube of myofibroblasts that you're trying to revert to fibroblasts. This is a cube of cardiomyocytes that you're trying to induce proliferation of. And this is a cube of endothelial cells where you want to induce um, tube formation. And you have three microRNA molecules. And you have to match the correct microRNA molecule to the correct cell cube, because only some microRNAs will have an effect on some things. So you can add it on. And for example, here, we can see it, that the correct microRNA was added. It's, the quality is a little bit low, but you can see that there's some tube formation going on. Here, oh, we got lost. Here you can see that what previously was a very red cube of myofibroblasts has now become fibroblasts. So this is a, a way for people to kind of experience and play with what it means to do high throughput screening and what, what, it, what the point is of high throughput screening. Um, finally, the, the last thing I want to talk to you about is um, a project that was born from the interregional project but has continued beyond. Um, which was the combination of machine learning and high throughput screening to identify antifibrotic chemical compounds. Um, originally, it started with a screen, because the screen is always the beginning. You have um, the in vitro model from reporter mice that are alpha SMA, RFP, and collagen GFP. So they have GFP on their collagen promoter and RFP on their alpha SMA promoter. When put in vitro, after a few days, they actually spontaneously transdifferentiate to myofibroblasts, but you can also speed up the process by adding TGF-beta, a recombinant protein, on top. Um, so here you have the untreated cells, and here you have them with TGF-beta. And what the screening was trying to do was find um, chemical compounds that will reduce this back to uh, the original state, so reduce transdifferentiation of myofibroblasts. We used 600 chemical compounds. We added fibroblasts from, from the alpha-SMA 
RFP collagen, EGFP mice, and TGF beta, and then fixed and stained for, for nuclei, and quantified the data. And this actually led to the identification of haloperidol as an antifibrotic drug. So this was already published. Um, but I then used this, this data from the screening that led to the haloperidol um, discovery. And we worked together with the JSI, which is the Josef Stefan Institute in Ljubljana. Um, in particular, the group of, um, Steph, of Sasha Jarowski. They're machine learning experts and um, artificial intelligence experts. And they took our data where you could see which drugs have which effect on, on collagen and on alpha SMA production. They built an algorithm based on the, the fingerprint of each drug, so on the structure um, of the drugs. So which structural components have which effect on fibrosis, basically. And using this algorithm, they then added it onto uh, the, they ran it through the Kemble library, the Kemble database, which is a database of one point, over 1 million compounds. I think 1.2 million compounds, chemical compounds, small drugs. So these um, predictions, we then got a prediction of 616 potential drugs that could also be used as an antifibrotic using a threshold of a decrease in alpha SMAP expression by 25%. I then took these 616 predicted compounds, divided them into two groups. In group one, I put all the compounds that are already in clinical trials. Most of them are corticosteroids, which is not really interesting because they can be used as antifibrotic, but mostly they're anti-inflammatory, so the antifibrotic is kind of a secondary thing. There were three novel ones that hadn't been in our screening, but um, they're from the statin and retinoin class, and those had ranked highly in our screening, so we didn't want to focus on those either. So then I focused more on group two. So in group two, I put all of the compounds that were novel, that, which are not in, in clinical trials, and I performed a secondary step of analysis. So I used the SMILE strings, which is the chemical, um, the chemical formula of these compounds, and using a, a website called ChemMine, um, you can put the SMILE string and it'll give you a prediction of which compounds are structurally similar to the, the structure that you inserted. So using this, this tool, I was able to find 545 of these 589 novel compounds were actually structurally related to uh, um, drugs that we had already screened for originally in the haloperidol project. So those were excluded. I looked at the other 44 that were left, and of the 44 that were not related to drugs in the screen, but were related to novel drugs, 19 of those were related to dopamine, 2 to topiramate, and 8 to zanamivir, and 15 to some others that were already linked partially to antifibrotic activity. So those, the three candidates that I decided to focus on were topiramate, zanamivir, and dopamine. In vitro, testing them in vitro, you can see that this is untreated cells. This is treated with alpha SMA. I'm sorry, this is treated with TGF beta, so you have an increase in alpha SMA expression. When you add dopamine, you actually have a strong decrease in alpha SMA expression. Topiramate and zanamivir did not have a very strong effect. And dopamine at 200 micromolar was toxic. So there's also a dose response. So using 50 or 100 micromolar of dopamine, you see a dose response. And um, going in vivo into a bleomycin model of lung fibrosis, you can actually see that even in vivo, you have a decrease in um, alpha SMI expression, so less myofibroblast activation, and a slight decrease also in collagen. But dopamine is um, not very stable. It gets degraded easily in vivo. It's something difficult to use and also has a lot of side effects. So instead of continuing with dopamine, I took a step back and looked at those 19 compounds that are predicted to be similar to um, dopamine and that are predicted to reduce alpha SMA. We then started another collaboration with the University of um, Trieste, the pharmacology department. And um, they looked at these 19 compounds and said, this is the one that's the least sterically active and the most easy to synthesize. And they created six derivatives for us. They were called SAR2 to SAR12. And those I went back in vitro. So this has been a very like, wet lab to virtual screening to experiments to back to synthesis, very back and forth project. Testing these um, compounds in vitro, I was able to see that SAR2 is able to decrease the amount of collagen and the amount of FSMI expression. But these were lipophilic compounds. So we then asked them to produce the um, hydrochloric salt for us. Also testing these in vitro, you can see that there's a nice dose response of the drug in vitro on reduction of alpha SMA positive cells. And here you have untreated cells treated with TGF-beta, then treated with dopamine, 
and here the dose response of increased doses of SAR2. So this seemed to be a promising drug. And um, we then also went with this one in vivo. Uh, before that, a slide on the, on the potential mechanism. So having started with dopamine, um, it seemed like a possibility that there would be an effect on dopamine receptors, that that would be the mechanism of how, how this drug is working. No? Um, so dopamine receptors, there's two classes. There's dopamine 1 and dopamine 2 recept dopamine 2 like receptors. Dopamine 1 is dopamine 1 like receptors contain dopamine 1 and dopamine 5. Dopamine 2 like receptors contain D2, D3 and D4. Um, checking by qPCR pulmonary and cardiac fibroblasts express only D3 and D4. So I used sRNA to target D3 and D4 and was able to see that using sRNA to target D3, I'm able to rescue the amount of alpha SMA that's produced by TGF-beta, so dopamine no longer had an effect. Using um, SI against D3 and D4, the same effect you can see with uh, SAR2. So also here, if you have untreated cells, you have um, low amounts of collagen and alpha SMA with TGF-beta, it's increased. Um, you use the control sRNA with SAR2 and you have a reduction, but if you use the DRD3 sRNA, you, you have an increase again. It's a little bit difficult to see, it's easier on the screen. <laughs> um, okay, so we're also working now with the university to do some docking experiments to see whether SAR2, because the structure is different than dopamine, whether it's even able to bind to DRD3, and we'll hopefully have some results on that soon. Um, in the meantime, we went in vivo in the bleomycin model, mouse bleomycin model, and saw that um, these are control cell, control mice, control lungs, so these are not bleomycin treated, and you have a low amount of collagen and low amount of aphasma. Upon treatment with bleomycin, after 14 days, you have a high amount of collagen activation and aphasma expression, and if you treat with SAR2 two days after having added bleomycin, you completely eliminate the fibrosis. Here's another overview where you can see collagen in control in bleomycin and then in treated, where the effect was really dramatic. And um, also on fibrosis and inflammatory infiltration, there seems to be a strong, a strong effect by SAR2. So this was, um, again, the screen is only the beginning because we started with a screen, had, had our result from the screen, but then used it further to find solutions for other diseases. So. Um, I want to thank you for your attention and thank the cardiovascular biology lab, particular Serena and the molecular medicine lab, particular Mauro Luca, also the University of, of Trieste, Daniele and Maria Grazia, and the Sasha Jarowski's group in Slovenia. And thank you guys.